Kuna Clamorous Podcast presents Needs More Grenadine. On today's episode, we talk venture with Jonas Venture Senior himself, Paul Bucock. Hey. Hey. All right. <laughs> um, thank you so much, by the way, for Absolutely. taking time to talk with, I guess, the fandom in general, but... Um, me in particular um i guess start out uh how did you get involved in the show because you have a more theater background yeah well i think that's kind of like part of the answer to that question is you could say that a lot about a lot of the people who were initially cast in the show um I think the, net, the the real casting director now chris and 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 uh, doc might disagree but I would say one of the major casting directors of the show early on was James Urbaniak himself. Um, they cast him and I kind of let, and, and I don't actually know how they ended up getting him. I think he was just kind of out there, out and about. Um, he had already been in Hal Hartley's Henry Fool and he was starting to get some episodic work. I don't remember if his infamous famous appearance on sex in the city where he's like the shoe fetishist came before the shoe fetish. Yeah. Right. I think that might've come before. So maybe, maybe he was on their radar screen on that level. And, you know, he has a very identifiable voice right off the bat. Even, even when you see him on screen, his voice leaps out to you as much as his face. Right. Right. Um, it sort of leads with his voice and then the face goes with it. Um, but I think Chris and Doc would say to him, do you know a guy who could? And I think the question was in 2003, four, um, do you know a guy who can sound like the voice of authority like, and I'm seeing them the character description, James Mason, Sean Connery um, and Gregory Peck. And I think James Urbaniak said, yeah, I know a guy who does each one of those voices individually. And I think he's probably the kind of guy who could probably merge them into one voice because that's kind of what I did. Um, so I remember coming in on the session, the very first session, which I th it was unclear were they, were they evaluating me or did I already have the job? So at that point, still a little unclear of uh, Jonas Sr. And they kind of took me through the paces of now do, now do James Mason, all right, Finn. Uh, now do, now do um, uh, Sean Connery, now mix them. And then they kept saying, but more, bigger, more rich, shout it, you know? And it, I mean, I remember it, it going from like it, a pretty, you know, I hadn't had that much experience. I had no experience doing voices for animation. So I didn't know, you know, what the, you know, it's like the question you always get in theater or film, how big, how small, is it a close up or is it wide angle? And they kept encouraging me to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until that became the default that he was generally always big voiced, <laughs> even when he was, um, <laughs> intimate <laughs> it still remained a large voice um and then you know again all the people that were sort of in those early stages except i probably think for um um uh, james warburton am i saying his name right uh, who patrick, already, warburton. Patrick, patrick warburton who already had you know um some Hollywood cred. I think the rest of the, the cast were then people that, that James would say, do you know a person who can? And in general, he would just kind of draw from all the people that he knew, Stephen Ritazzi, um, Nina Hellman. And he would just kind of pick and choose the people that he knew from doing theater or going to parties with theater people after the theater who could, who in their collection of parlor tricks could do, you know, a given kind of voice. Um, 
And then the, the thing is, because we were all theater, you know, kind of theater types, and I would say, to a certain extent, a specific breed of theater type in New York, like a downtown theater type, you know, less Broadway or even off Broadway and more sort of off off Broadway experimental theater types. Um, they'd bring us in and we were all kind of like flexible Swiss army knife uh, actors. And they'd say, you know, Jack or Chris would say, also there are a couple other lines. Can you do the voice of a, of, of, um, what's the, the, uh, do you want to play a game from war games? Can you do that voice? And I'd say, yeah, I can do that. Um, can you do, what's, can you do, um, a uh, Mark Twain, and I'd say, no, but I can do, I'm trying to think of the actor who plays Mark Twain over and over and over again, uh, who also played Deep Throat in All the President's Men. It's, it's slipping my mind from at this point. Um, I'd say, but I can do him, who does a lot of Mark Twain work. Um, can any, can I, you know, so there were always, there were always like play parts that they needed to fill, five line parts seven line parts. Uh, we need a, a weird, uh, you know, Southern minister part. And I think probably every one of us who came in, who was a guy would read for it. And then, then they pick, you know, they pick and choose which one came out best. So that's how I ended up in there because I was part of like this particular downtown theater, less film, some TV. I mean, almost everybody in the cast has probably also did Law and Order at least once, uh, because that's what you did in New York. Yeah, a it's theater. a theater trope. Yeah, it was a theater thing, and like everybody in New York. I mean, it's all changing in the last ten years, fifteen years. Now there's lots of casting in New York yeah. for all, for everything, and lots of production in New York. But at that time, there really wasn't much TV and 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 film production. Soaps had died. There was there was Cosby. And there was Law and Order, the six or seven varietals. And so we all, that those early voice actors, and, and particularly in those first couple of years of the show, tended to be just theater people that James Urbani acted. I really, th I think you, if you look down the list, yeah, it would be like yeah, that. Yeah, um, that was actually, um, <laughs> someone actually in the subreddit server when I was asking for questions for you, uh, they said, so I was going down the list and it just seems like it's 90% Hammer, McCulloch and Bukok just screaming at each other, just the cast list. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, really, really definitely, most definitely. And it was, I mean, it's, it's funny, it was an interesting scene then too. That was an interesting kind of theater scene then. It's New York you know, New York and its art scene has changed a lot since then. It's like it, you know, it more and more, New York became more and more Hollywoodified and people who were Hollywood people and New York people, it's, there's much more crossover. In, yeah. in those times, there was much more of a like delineation. You're always, New York actors are always asking each other, are you going to go to Hollywood? Are, are you going to go to pilot season? Are you going to go to pilot season in California? Yeah. Um, now, People can, you know, and I think the pandemic is going to change this even more and more. I think people are going to more and more not even have to be based anywhere. Yeah, oh, uh, God, yeah. In particular, I think it's like if you if somebody puts, sends a good tape from Fargo, North Dakota, that'll be fine, too. And then we ca cast that guy. You Bring know? him in. Yeah. yeah. Who cares? Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess you got kind of into that. But um, what we're so recording those first few episodes do you have any idea going in like the cultural impact that the show would have i suspected that i wasn't the only one who was obsessed with this, the main things that those guys were obsessed with yeah um torsion <laughs> <laughs> um david bowie uh, Johnny Quest, uh, Scooby Doo, uh, James Bond, James Bond villains, James Bond hench, henchmen to villains, like 
it was a, it, it had like, um, and I think people, a lot of people are, are obsessed with those things. I mean, we're still living in a time when it's like, you know, my daughter who's 16 years old loves James Bond movies, even though she thinks they're totally wrong and misogynistic and horrible that way, but she still loves them. Yeah. And she's got more posters of David Bowie in her room than I do. And, um, on her, on her, uh, you know, her, her Spotify list, she's got more Bowie on her Spotify list than I do. So I think a lot of those things still, I, I didn't see those things as like obscure. Yeah. You know, the, the things they were into were not obscure. It was just, that they were the first ones to kind of come up with this idea that you could have this style of animation that what, that harkened back to this particular time in animation history and then merge that with other things that were more current, more current concerns. Yeah. Or, and then mix in some nostalgia to some previous concerns and kind of, and kind of bounce back and forth between, oh my God, the, the world of Jonas Venture Sr. is so retro and, and wrong and swinging 60s and, and sunken living rooms that are totally carpeted and plush and everybody's doing everything totally wrong and parenting their kids wrong. Yeah. Uh, I think that was kind of a thing that was a touchstone uh, that I could see already existing there. Like the, th the idea of, uh, you know, the, like latchkey children, <laughs> yeah. that we were a generation of latchkey children who had been raised on television and we didn't necessarily pick the television that we were supposed to be watching. Okay. Yeah. We watched Mr. Rogers if we felt really, really insecure and needed comfort but we also watched a lot of really disturbing things without much supervision. And um, our parents were like getting divorced and messed up. And, and the idea of then bringing that in seemed like that's going to work. Um, again, you never know because it's always like something that's really intelligent. Um, is that going to stick? It always seems like stupid things stick, but um it was the TV was going through a transition at that time where because the dial was increasing in the number of bandwidths, it seemed more possible that something like that, if it had enough market share in a given slot um, and, you know, then streaming comes in, I was like, I think this thing might have some legs. Um, and I also noticed after a couple of seasons that Doc and Chris didn't, it's like they took the, um, faulty towers rule don't make too many at a time like yeah. keep the quality level high at the risk of having the fan base irritated you know every time I go to some convention or something so it's like when are they going to get it come on with the next episode it's been two years but that always I always saw that as a plus you know it kept the the interest high and then they could deliver five good episodes instead of um, 13 okay episodes where the best jokes are spread out in 13 shows as opposed to five or six. I thought that was, I thought that was smart. I don't, know, I don't know if it was always by design. I think it was just as many as they could do at a time. But I think that was smart of them. It kept it going for more years. Yeah, and I know uh, it's also spread the like it's now cross i don't know if you realize it but it's uh we're getting into like i think third generation of fans now and yeah. so um i mean i personally was one of the, those kids who was watching it when i shouldn't have been right. <laughs> um, exactly adult swim yeah which of yeah. course is really like please come <laughs> please come we're yeah. at we're, it's cartoons Come on. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, but there are, I, I mean, I know there are like 17 year olds that are just like picking it up like, during quarantine and being like, oh, this is a really smart, good show. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to sort of hear that the impact it's just it's it's fun as a fan to watch i can't imagine how it's like for someone involved in the show 
I mean, it's crazy because it's like, here I am a guy who like, I've had a theater career of sorts and I've did a little of this and that, but, um, you know, I have a regular de- job life and family life and all that. And then I've gone to these conventions and like, there's this group of people who are like s- suddenly in on that day, like no other day of the year, I'm sort of a star of some kind because people are so into that, are, are so into it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and they're smart and, and, and it's interesting because they're like a smart group of people. So they'll get into a room and they can really talk to each other and get it and like, get like heads about it, you know, get their yeah. heads, get their heads in each other's heads about it. Um, you know, and that's, that's what a cult following is, <laughs> you know, it's like a, yeah, it's yeah. like a band. It's like a band that everybody, that, that, that certain people love, you know, it's like loving the velvet underground again. Yeah. You know, yeah. The- doc, a doc thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, and it's totally been credited as like, oh, this is the Velvet Underground of animation. Because also, yeah. so many people who have uh, come fans, who are fans of it, have gone on and made things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm talking to somebody tomorrow. So strange because I hadn't thought, I hadn't been doing many things related to venture for a while. And then talking to somebody tomorrow who wants to pitch a show um, and wants to talk to me about it because they think I might know a little bit about how they should be pitching their show based on Venture Brothers. <laughs> based on sort of where do I find the target audience? How does one do that? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. it's, it's all over the place now. Yeah. An interesting one. Sorry to dive in here, but my daughter watches, has binge watches that's what's the more, more modern version of Scooby-Doo. Um, it's more about the name of the van. Mach- something or other uh, machine. Uh, I don't know. But there's it. I have noticed when watching it with her and Warburton is in it in the more up to date version. Oh, I, I missed mystery. That. It's like mystery incorporated. Mystery incorporated. Bingo. Yeah. It has become it is has been obviously influenced by Venture Brothers. Oh, God. And the yeah. new DuckTales, too. Like, could yeah. you watch those? Yeah. It's even, and even, like, subtle things. Like, there's... Um, so I think someone actually... I think he was actually a storyboard artist, the creator of it. Uh, OKKO OK had, like, even, like, the Monarchs and Brick Frog right. in it. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about it for the Mystery Incorporated because there was a scene in one of them where there was a band in it that was like a Velvet Underground knockoff. <laughs> that was playing a Velvet, and it was, a, it was quite good. Like the, the song that they were playing was like, if that had been on the first Velvet Underground movie it, uh, album, I would have said, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like it didn't, seem, it didn't seem like a knockoff. It seemed like it might've actually been. Yeah, yeah. I, I I will say, Mystery Incorporated is really good. Mm-hmm. I, I, I I I've I've enjoyed it myself. Yeah. Um, no, I know. It's very good. Um. So it was. It's slowly been revealed over the course of the show uh, that Jonas was really kind of a menace to society and a horrible yeah. person yeah um when if ever did you get your like first like hints that that was where they were going beyond mm-hmm. just a negligent father <laughs> yeah it it never i, I didn't i thought it was going to go there from the beginning because <laughs> the way he would talk to his son indicated that he was corrupt through and through. Yeah. But not in a but in a way that was that would have been standard level of corrupt parent from that time. Yeah. Like the same parent who was negligent of his kid in the 60s would have also worked for the Rand Corporation doing statistical analysis of, of um, body counts in Vietnam. 
Yeah. <laughs> or um, figuring out the latest uh, military hardware that could napalm more people in less time. Like it, that seemed normal to me because I knew parents like that. Yeah. The same parents who were negligent of their children. Also, you found out later on they were doing like big evil things. Just horrible. <laughs> sort of like it, that doesn't surprise me. You know, you see people be, I don't know. I see it in the world today, the kind of people who, mm, the, 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 you know, <laughs> one of the first times I decided that, yeah, Donald Trump is a horror, as a horror show. Yeah. And so political was he's on TV uh, talking to Larry King. And he's, he says, you know, I've never changed him. I've never changed one of my kids diapers. And I was like, you had five kids and not once when you felt the kids backside and knew there was a, a, the kid needed a changing, you didn't once volunteer to change the diaper, like do a guy a favor and change the diaper. Um, (laughs) So I think of the kind of people who, who are negligent that way as those are the first candidates for being, for being like, you know, James Bond villains. Yeah. <laughs> you know, same character. So there is no, there's no surprise there. The cryogenics piece in the end um, <laughs> was a delightful surprise. But again, I wasn't like, oh, that's not, uh, of course, of course, that's what, it, that's what happened. Yeah, of course. You know? Yeah. Isn't that what Disney did? I mean, isn't that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah. The rumor is Disney did it. Who knows if that's true? Yeah. One, one day. One day. Yeah, yeah. One day. No, Ted Williams. <laughs> but he didn't do it. His son did it. His son apparently cut off Ted Williams' head and it's cryogenically frozen somewhere. That's so reassuring. <laughs> well, someday, you know, you can reattach him in the, to another guy's body who's like not <laughs> as good of a hitter in baseball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> um. So, was there like um, a favorite character you voiced? I know you did. You did Jonas, but you also like there's like Sunny, and then there was the therapist, and you know, like I I I loved doing them all, but Sunny was like was. I love doing because it wouldn't necessarily have been something that I would necessarily have been asked to do. Like, again, that was kind of the beauty of their casting process at times, you know, you get a big budget animated feature, right. Um, whether it's, uh, motion stop motion by Wes Anderson or, or some CGI thing done by Disney, they get somebody who is that guy to do that voice. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, and, and they're all gonna, only going to do that voice. That's it. Um, but in this whole process, we, I got asked to do some things I would have never gotten asked to do. And nobody would have thought of me. I've never, would, you, you wouldn't look at me and say, that's guys, that guy's um, the, sh- the shaggy character from Scooby-Doo, but, uh, you know, on junk. <laughs> but, but, but son of Sam. Yeah, yeah. but son of Sam. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have thought, you wouldn't have thought to do that but um but that but i got a chance to do it and it's it's that's always like a that's always like a treat in acting if you ever if you ever get a chance to do something that you don't normally get asked to do because we most of us actors think we're capable of doing anything yeah and it's not true we're not (laughs) but we we would love to be given the chance to try because people love to be surprised i mean so that so I, so I'd say that one in particular definitely hits hits a note for me. You know? um, is there any particular uh, line of dialogue from the show that's stuck with you? <laughs> that's a good one. Um, I think still from uh, the oh, the intro to um, the Sargasso Sea. Yeah. That still sticks with me as like the biggest time thing I ever got to do. Like 
to do a sequence where I got to do words from David, from a David Bowie song that was dear to me from high school with another actor friend of mine, him doing the David Bowie voice, but me doing a completely not David Bowie voice back and forth as dialogue to a point where I'm saying, ground control to Major Tom, your second's dead, there's something wrong. You know, I'm like, I don't think David Bowie imagined it being said that way. No, no. <laughs> and it was like, um, yeah, I would say that's, it, 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 there's a lot of good stuff that I got to do in that, but that, that's, the, that's the topper. Cause it was just, it was a lot of things layered. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like getting to do that, getting to do the character, the context of where is this boat in the world, Sargas OC, what the heck is that? I kind of know what it is. Was that near the Bermuda Triangle? I don't know. Um, and then this Bowie layering, <laughs> double Bowie layering. And um, yeah, I love that sequence. That's a, that's a, that you could put that in a um, time capsule. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, a gorgeous of, too. Yeah, that's beautifully sequenced. Um, it's interesting because that kind of animation, you know, you can do more sophisticated kinds of animation, but it uses that kind of animation in, in a, to its best, um, you know, and shows that there is some, there is art in that kind of animation. Yeah. If you do yeah. It from beginning to end. Um, so we touched on this a little bit, uh, but one of our listeners wanted to know uh, what was a, What's a typical recording session with uh, Doc and Chris? It's hmm. a good. That's a good one. Um, it's like you've been given this. You've been given the sides ahead of time. Um, you sort of prepare if you can. You know, at least get yourself familiar with it. Um, but then, and the good thing about them is they let you do it kind of the way you imagined it initially, um, but then you get taken through it in other ways. And it's like, you know, I don't know, because I haven't, I haven't done that much animation work, but the, the conversation is ongoing while you're doing it. Like they're, in, they're, they're out behind the other side of the glass and they're both there, they're talking and they sort of stay with you the whole time. It's sort of like, you know, you're in the ship there in there in Houston, Houston control. And they're talking to you, Bukak more, we need more, louder, step away from the microphone, back away from the microphone, shout it, you're dying, you're dying now, you're dying. You know, I'm like, I'm imagining that sequence in uh, the movie Blow Up where the photographer character is like bringing the person, you know, like almost, to, you know, getting intimate with them to get to get the performance out. Um, so I would say more than a lot of voice jobs I've done along the way, they're very much there in a conversation to get the right, to get the right performance out. Um, and that's from beginning to end, like from doing the first ones back in 2004, I think, I feel like the first recordings were in 2003, all the way to the last ones that did in 2015, 2016, they never were any less committed to getting it right and what's also cool is they had very specific ideas of what they wanted but if you could come up with something that was different that they didn't imagine uh, they were open to being delighted by that as well again the the one i think about is being the voice of that elevator i'm like you know they, they, they didn't even know what that was in yeah. fact, it wasn't even it wasn't even supposed to be a person. They were actually going to do that later in like post production with like a, a synthesizer. Yeah. And somehow I spotted it in the script and said, "Can I give that one a chance?" And um, and rolled that one out for them. And like, I think Doc. Th I think when I did that, I think Doc, I've I've been in Doc's good graces since. <laughs> that's, that's not something he thought a person did. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a human character. Uh, yeah yeah no um 
So did, did you? So you talked about how you modeled uh, Jonas off of sort of this Sean Connery, Gregory Peck, yeah, archetype. Yeah, they have a Connery character in the show. Yeah, uh, so, Colonel Gentleman. <laughs> right. So they they steered me more towards Peck. Towards the yeah, towards you know, sort but, of an Atticus Finch type. Exactly, Atticus Finch yelling. Yelling at being a horrible father. <laughs> yes. What if that? What if? What if Gregory Peck wasn't so nice? <laughs> what if? What if he was just awful? There we go. It turns out. All um, that you heard about him. You're wrong. He was terrible. He was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so did you pull from like anything personal in your. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I, I guess if you. I guess a little bit like my father was a school headmaster. He was the headmaster of my school and his father was a school headmaster. This father, the headmaster of his school. And I was always very accustomed to men in charge who were the voice of authority. And the way I think maybe I got through it was to imagine what if my father, when he was making some announcement in assembly, said things that were all wrong instead of the things you're, that are right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I spent a lot of time with my best friend in grade school like mumbling, what if my father, instead of saying, you know, um, at four o'clock, everybody's going to leave this room and go down to the gym and uh, you're going to get a different pair of sneakers and you're going to have to replace your sweaty socks with clean socks before you leave the school premises. And I would then imagine, what if it was something completely other than that? Yeah. Like everybody's going to leave this room, remove all their clothes, jump out the window. Um, it's going to be a mass suicide of children in my school. It's going to be a tragedy. Sorry for that, but please do it. <laughs> I'd be mumbling this to like my friend. Um, so the, uh, so like, I think I've always been entertained by the idea of authority figures who, um, who go wrong. My father didn't, strangely yeah, enough. Yeah. He, was, he was kind of like a total straight shooter. And I, I would say 99 out of 100 decisions he made in his life, 99 out of 100 piece of, pieces of advice he gave in his life were good. Yeah. But I always found it more entertaining to imagine the idea of what if it was all wrong? <laughs> what if the voice of authority was giving you information that you really should ignore? But you're okay. taking it and going with it just because it sounds authoritative. Yeah. It's an ongoing theme, particularly in this country. Like if somebody can, <laughs> if they sound, sound right, people do it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm always endlessly surprised at that. But then again, I guess if you say, you know, you would just, like there, there's another voice of authority that I could always probably follow if you do it right. It just wouldn't be that kind. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> um, this was an odd one too. Uh, another listener one. Uh, did you ever feel bad playing Jonas when he's did so many bad things? No. <laughs> Never. I mean, I think most actors you get into acting, that's part of the pleasure is like, yeah, is getting to do something aberrant that you don't that you can't do by law that's, <laughs> that's that's why people get into to theater and doing plays and films is like you know like is robert de niro really a bad guy <laughs> i mean maybe he's done some things that are bad in his life but he seems to be awfully good three quarters of the time at playing somebody who's at least deeply flawed and yeah. almost half the time mentally unhinged and like <laughs> The, the exploration of that is like, that's why you get into performing is so you can explore things that you're not, not allowed to explore normally. So the short answer is no, it's, wow. it's, it's always a pleasure. And it's always, ple it's always a pleasure to try to find number one. Oh, Hal Hartley, the film director once said to me when I did 
I think I was doing an imitation of Reagan in something. And he said, the problem with your imitation, Bukak, is that you, you hate him. And I can see that you hate him. It'll work if you start to do it in a way that says you found what you, what, what's lovable about him. That's when, that's when the guy will seem really sinister, is if you seem to love it, um, then we'll believe then we'll believe it more and that will be more affecting. You know? Yeah. So yeah. That's what people get into acting to do do bad things and not get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I <know>? mean Yeah. <laughs> um uh it'd be wrong of me not to ask uh do you have a favorite episode? <sighs> I, I can't, I can't say, I can't, I can't, I can't not say Spana Capita. I think I have to say that. Um, I got to do a lot in that. I got to, I, got, I bet I, I got to do that a lot. I got to do a lot in that one. Um, but I would say uh, Sargasso is still, even though it's only really that beginning cut, um, that's still my favorite. The whole, the way, the, the way the episode then plays out from there as well yeah um and that's not to say i don't like the episodes f further along as you go yeah but maybe like you know your first loves are your truest loves in some way <laughs> too um that one still still works for me like i haven't let my daughter watch the show yet um she watches you know things like avatar which she loves and lots of uh, mystery incorporated um, but I would say that would be the first one I'd have her watch. Yeah. Of all of them. Cause I think it would, it would give her a lot of information about the show as a whole, even without having to go back to the first, like watch that. If you like that, then we that, can go. Back. Then we go back and yeah. And see if, and see if you want to play the whole thing out. Yeah. Um, so I have one final question. Uh, this is from another, uh, another listener this you this is the one you may or may not be able to answer um, okay who do you think killed jonas venture senior do you think he opened the doors on movie night you know um i don't know i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm I, i'd like to make up something clever but i don't know um and i guess i say i i would say i don't mind not knowing yeah. I don't mind not knowing um, if for no other reason that it still leaves the possibility that uh, they may be able to somehow scratch another couple more episodes out and then we find out. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously they have an answer. Um, I've never been told uh, what the answer is. Um, again, I'm comfortable with it and and I'm not even comfortable with it if it's never answered, clearly. Yeah. yeah. You know, I guess that's that's my non-answer answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good non-answer answer. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. For talking with us. Um, mm -hmm. Could I get a go team venture before yeah. we go? Hold on. More light. Go! Go team venture, go! <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>